standing as we read God's Word. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Chapter 7, we have entered into the third chapter now of our Lord's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll read to you the first six verses, but make no promises that we will actually get through all six of these verses this evening. <clears throat> in Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt clearly, or shalt, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. And we'll stop there. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace, and watch care over us. <clears throat> we thank thee, Our Father, for the day you've provided and blessed us with. We thank thee, Our Lord, for allowing us the privilege of coming to your house. And I ask, Lord, that you be with me tonight as thy servant, and may you give me liberty and unction from on high to present thy word in truth and in love. I ask, Lord, that you would be with the, the requests that have been made known unto the church, those that I mentioned, and many others, Lord, that I did not mention. Thou knowest the needs of each one, and we ask, Lord, that thy healing hand would be upon those that are sick. And Father, we pray for those that are lost, that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior. We thank you, our Father, for allowing us the, the absolute honor and, again, privilege it is to come to your house. And we ask, Father, that you would forgive us of our sins. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. So as I said, we've moved now into the last chapter, if you will, of the teachings of our Lord and what is referred to the Sermon on the Mount. Tonight we will title the message, Judging Others, Judging Others. Again, you, will, you know that the Sermon on the Mount of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does span over these three chapters of Matthew's Gospel in chapter 5, 6, and 7. And we have been taking our time as we've been going through these. We started with the Beatitudes and we have just continued to go on through these very valuable teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I've said every week that every time we think that maybe the next lesson may be a little bit easier, they're not. And certainly the next two weeks will show us that. And uh, we have a tendency in life as believers, and certainly many unbelievers, but we have a tendency in this life as believers, as human beings, <clears throat> to see the fault in everyone else, and we fail to see the faults in our own lives. We are quick to judge. We are quick to see what everybody else is doing wrong, and more often than not, we don't look at ourselves to see our own <clears throat> wrongs. Again, remember... As always, throughout this sermon, these are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, what I seek to do as the preacher of the Word of God is to extract out of these words the teaching of what our Lord Jesus Christ says in His preaching that was inspired of God. These words are not for me to preach them and what I want them to say, or what we think they ought to say, or what we hope that they say, carried down by tradition, or carried down by, you know, what we, again, want them to say, or what we think they say, but we must preach them and teach them as thus saith the Lord. 
We don't want to add to what God says, and we certainly don't want to take away from what God says by any stretch of the imagination. So as we go through these, you remember that these are the words of the Lord. These are the direct words of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when the Bible says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, you see in that, and, and, and if you don't, hopefully by the end of tonight you will, that you will see that the Lord is not saying directly that we would not judge anything. What? For with what judgment ye judge. We can't make that say something else. And I'm hoping by the end of this message to describe clearly what verse 2 is teaching. Even though we might not want it to be teaching what it's teaching, the fact is, the Lord says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And already you're thinking, ah, what is the pastor saying up there? I'm a Baptist. We don't judge. We never judge. What is he doing? He's going. He's off his rocker. Get him off of the pulpit. But we've got to read and we've got to study what God says. And again, that's going to make sense all the way in the second part of the message, though. So you're going to have to trust me until we get there to be able to explain that to you. After all, the Word of God says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, right? The Word of God says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is all Scripture. That is every word that is in the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so we've got to know that all of this is from God. So as far as the message is already here, they are the words of God. Now again, I've already said this at the beginning of the introduction. Now I'm going to say it towards the end of the introduction. But again, we have a tendency in life as believers, as human beings, to see the fault, right, in everyone else. We are really good at that. We are really good within ourselves. Whether we mean to do it or not, we are still really good at pointing out the faults of others. We, it's almost second nature. It's almost as easy as breathing. In fact, perhaps as believers, as children of God, uh, we, we find that we do that far more often uh, than we should. We've been learning in the Sermon on the Mount week after week, 28 weeks worth now, especially in chapters 6 and 7, how righteous acts are seen in God's sight as very commendable how they can easily turn into something that is showy and hypocritical, right? So the things that we've been learning, when ye give alms, right? Don't give them so that you're seen of men, but do them for the glory of God. When you pray, don't pray that you are seen of men, but you do it in secret so that the Lord that sees you in secret shall reward thee openly. So the things that we do that are right and good to do can easily become showy, and hypocritical, right? So tonight, and probably next week, the Lord willing, we're going to look at judgment, judging others. Let us look closely tonight, and we'll do that in the second part of the message, of these words of our Lord in verses 1 and 2, to see if we're quick to judge others without first examining what is going on in our own life. So again, two parts. First of all, I want us to examine or how easily we do judge others. That's what we're going to talk about first tonight. And then secondly, I want us to look at the teachings of judgment. Okay? So again, first of all, how we easily judge others. Unfortunately, as I've said in the introduction, it is characteristic of human beings that many of us judge others and we often miss ourselves. The old adage goes, and it's been said many times, but I find it to be very true. When you point the finger at others, you've got four pointing back at you. Right? When you point out one, 
You've got four pointing back at you. Or, depends how you hold your thumb. It could be three or four, depending on how you hold your thumb when you're pointing your finger out. So, probably at least three to one ratio. It's not the point of the whole message, so don't get hung up there. We've heard that many a times. You know, when you have one, when you're pointing one finger out, you have three pointing back at you. We as Christians tend to be experts at sorting out everyone else's business and everyone else's wrongdoing, but we are terrible not looking at ourselves. Nobody wants to look at their self. You don't want to look at your own faults. It's no fun to look at the mirror and then have to look at how big your nose is and say, man, that is an ugly nose. I mean, there's nothing fun about that. Yep, talking about myself there. Don't worry, right? There's nothing fun about looking at the mirror and looking back and seeing a big old pimple on your forehead saying, wow, that's a big old fault. There's nothing fun about looking at your other faults or looking at your own faults. We don't enjoy doing that. It doesn't bring joy to do that in any aspect of our life. But man, we're really good at it. And I mean we as a people. I don't mean we as just a church. I mean we as a people are really good at looking at everybody else's faults. We can sure point them out. And we have got the solution, right? We know exactly what they need to do in order to not have those faults anymore. But the teaching here, and more of what we'll get into next week, especially in verses 3 and 4, is we have got, we have no right, no <clears throat> scriptural liberty to judge others without first examining the beam that is in our own eyes, right? We're terrible at looking at ourselves. It hurts. We don't like to know our own faults. We don't like to know and see and acknowledge what we're doing wrong. But the book of James, and we'll be in James a couple of times this evening, in James chapter 1, in verses, let's just read verses 22 through 25, says this, James 1, 22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now listen, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So in other words, we, we forget about where we came from. We can forget about our faults. And we so quickly point out the faults of everybody else. More often than not, we, we end up like Job's friends, right? Job's friends who, who say wisdom will die with us. We feel that perhaps we have the right or even the ability to sort out everyone else's life without the ex expectation or even looking in to our own life. And when we start thinking that we can sort out everybody else's life and we can look at everybody else and we can see all the wrong that everybody else is doing, pride easily creeps up. When we begin thinking that we have it all together, there is no beam in our way, we quickly fall. We can easily think, well, there's no one quite like me. But the fact of the matter is that anybody can criticize and condemn and can complain. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to do any of those things. Right? I'm not sure who this author is, but he said some very wise words. His name is Doug Barnett, and he said this, Christians would never dream of intentionally running down other people with their cars, and why do they do it with their tongues? Christians would never dream of intentionally running down other people with their cars, and why do they do it with their tongues? 
You know, and we've read already, I've referenced James and the tongue already in our messages on the Sermon on the Mount, but I do want to read to you again the scriptures tonight about the tongue and how easily it can tear down, how easily it can feel like a car has run over you with words. In James chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is turned, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame, and is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. That tongue is so dangerous. Listen. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. We have people that can tame lions. We have people that can tame tigers. We have people that tame birds. There are people out there that tame beast and cat, all kinds of different things that can be tamed. But the tongue, the little thing in your mouth, can no man tame. It is unruly evil full of deadly poison. And so quick we are to judge others and speak the words and hurt. Okay? C.A. Joyce says, Two things are very bad for the heart. Running upstairs <laughs> and running down people. Right. We've got to take a very serious look at this. Because again, we so easily judge what someone is doing or what someone is not doing. We so easily judge how someone is dressed. We so easily judge how someone looks, how someone walks, how someone talks, how someone doesn't do this, how someone does that, how someone didn't do this, how someone did too much of that. We easily, easily do those things. <clears throat> and before I go any further, there is something I do not want to happen this evening. That thing I don't want to happen this evening is this. Tonight, I do not want us to apply this sermon to somebody else. Forget about it. If you do that, you've missed the point of this sermon altogether. For this illustration, for this sermon, for the fundamental point of this sermon is not to do that. Is not to judge anybody else. So right now, before we get even to this next part, we need to ignore and not think about the person that is not in the house of the Lord tonight. Stop thinking about who is not here, and we need to apply everything to ourselves. Not only will we be better for that, but our brother and sister in Christ will be better for that. And beloved, you know this as well as I do. How many times do I get a message that I deliver? At least Three, right? When I receive it from the Lord, when I study it, and when I deliver it, and then maybe sometimes a fourth when I rehear it on the way home. No, I'm just kidding. We don't even ride together on the way home. So that really. Second part of the message is let's look into this teaching a little bit more closely. All right. Verses 1 and 2, again, and I'm going to read, I'm going to actually read verses 1 through 3 again here. <coughs> Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. 
And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Well, let's look into this judgment, or into this teaching of judgment. Now, what the Lord, again, what we're seeing here is your judgment will become your judge. Your judgment will become your judge. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. So, there is a very delicate, righteous judgment that I'm going to describe that we do discern as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's going to be scriptural, not just Justin, background of that. And the very fearful thing is, we've got to be really careful in our judgment because we are affected by sin and we are not the righteous judge. The righteous judge is the Lord Jesus Christ and he gives righteous judgment and he does righteous judgment. We're tainted with sin and so we've got to be triple, super, super careful before we ever think that we have the right or obligation to judge in any way at all. All right? Let me, again, explain here. So, God will judge you with the same standards that you judge others. Do you expect a lot from others? Well, do you? Well, if you expect a lot from others, then a lot is expected of you. If you expect high standards of the church and high standards of the pastor and high standards of the elders and high standards of missionaries and you have high standards of your brothers and sisters in Christ, then guess what? You've got to have some high standards for yourself. Again, hear me out before you discharge me completely from the pulpit. Because I don't believe that neither I or the Lord are giving permission to just go around and casting demon judgments upon other people. And look again, looking at everybody else, when we have our own beam to consider, when we have our own beam in our way, how can we even begin to think that we can righteously look to judge others when we've got our own stuff that we got to deal with? we got a lot of our own stuff to deal with, don't we? All right. Well, let me... Again, try to explain this here, all right? Turn over to verse 15 of the same chapter. The same chapter. Chapter 7 and verse 15. When we talk about judgment and we might, you know, we're more comfortable using the word fruit examiners. We're more comfortable with using the word discerning. I get all that. Scripture says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Now, again, looking at verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing... But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Now, how are you going to know them if you're not judging, examining, discerning their fruits? You can use those words. The scripture says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. That is, clothing. That is part of our responsibility as one of the Lord's churches. That is part of my responsibility as the pastor of this church. Right? To not allow somebody that we would know that goes against everything that we believe, that preaches a different version of the Bible. And in doing that, I am, and I'll use the quotes, judging what they are standing for. Otherwise, how would I be able to discern, there's another word that we use, them from preachers that do come and preach for us. Right? Okay. Our very section, or <clears throat> in our very text I read in verse 6, go back to Matthew 7, 6, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast, you, your, cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. How are we meant to follow that command if we don't recognize who the dogs are or who the swine are? We've got to discern. There's got to be a measure of judgment. Now, we are not the righteous judge, but if we are going to ever judge, we better make sure we're doing it righteously. <laughs> okay? 
okay, you will find that more often than not, we are not qualified to give any kind of judgment because, again, we have got to deal with our own stuff first. Okay? Turn with me. <coughs> again, I want you to... <coughs> excuse me. So, I'm sorry. John chapter 7 and verse 24. I want you to see some of these things tonight. John chapter 7 and verse 24. And the Word of God uh, says this. John 7 and verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, beloved, the theme of this entire sermon in the book of Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount is don't be like the Pharisees that judge on the outward appearance, but we do things righteously according to God's principles and God's laws. Fruit examiners, again, if you will. Now, if we study the writings of the Apostle Paul, you will see how when he writes to the Corinthians, that he concludes that they are carnal, that they are babes in Christ, that they need to seek out meat and maturity and spirituality. What would you call that that Paul said of them? A judgment? Could we use that? Maybe. Maybe. In Paul's last letter to the church, he mentions Alexander, Demas, and... I can't pronounce this last guy's name. Um, <laughs> and he warns the people of God against them. Right? Beware of false prophets. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 10. Acts chapter 13 and verse 10. Word of God says this. I'm getting there. Acts 13, 10. And said, O oh, full of all civility and all of mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Those are really harsh words. I personally would not think that I am adequate by any stretch of the imagination to be able to use or cast judgment in that way. The crux, or the... I use the word crux a lot. I don't know why. It's not a word I normally use. <laughs> the heart of the matter is this. They had a righteous character that qualified them to discern, to examine, to judge others. Let me give another example. In the New Testament, we, as the Lord's Church, are given responsibility to keep the church pure. In order to do that, sometimes we have to make a Again, we don't like this word, a judgment on things when we have adequate evidence. We exercise discipline based on things or what people are not doing according to the word of God. Right? That is a responsibility that God gave to his church. Right? The local church, again then, is, is to judge the serious sins of its members and take appropriate action according to the pattern given to us in Matthew chapter 18 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You can read those chapters. We are to examine, discern, judge the doctrine and the teachings and the teachers according to the Word of God. Again, I use my illustration Part of my responsibility and part of your responsibility as Grace Baptist Church, right? If I go way off, right, you are going to cast a judgment that I have gone away from the truth and the church is going to decide to remove me from the office of the pastor. 
when somebody says, I want to preach at your church, we have to make a discernment, an examination, a judgment of if they hold to the things that we, by and large, hold to. Are they going to preach to us from the King James Bible? Do they believe that salvation is the sovereign will of God? Right? Do they believe that it's all of grace? These are some vital things that we're going to need to know before we would ask them to preach for us. Now, hope you're able and you're keeping up with me here. All right? We examine those who have the qualifications of, of being an elder, being a pastor, being a deacon. That's how they're appointed. We are to discern people who are unruly, those who divide. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14, how can we do that? If we don't examine or if we don't discern, how can we do this? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Now listen, see that none render evil for evil to any man, but either, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Right? Warn them that are unruly. Again, how are we going to know if somebody's unruly? By examining, discerning those things. We've got to discern who needs comfort. There are times when people need comfort, and we're not judging them because they need comfort, but we're discerning that they need comfort. Discern who's weak, who needs to be strengthened. Right? We've got to do it <coughs> righteously. So that gets us now to the second verse here. But oftentimes, more often than not, we look at others and never what is wrong with us. So verse 2 of our text talks about judgment, and then it talks about measure. If the judgment is the standard of the harshness wherewith you judge, the measure is the amount of judgment that you give to another. So what we need to consider is this. Just like almsgiving, paying our, our tithes and offerings and fasting and the other things that we do for the Lord, when we engage in the righteous act of discernment, when you are harsh upon another, when you pile on a measure of judgment that you are like to, make sure that you are doing it righteously. Make sure that you have no beam in your eye at all before you would be able. That's why it's important. So thankful for a church body that has the authority to take matters on you know, people that uh, may be in discipline or things like that. Because, again, speaking for myself, I know I have... Right? Like many of us, things that we got to work on. Okay? So I would say that a large extent of our judgment is unrighteous. And I would say that we need to err on the side of caution. Right? So, err on the side of caution. You are better not to judge than to judge unrighteously. <laughs> It is better for you not to judge than to judge unrighteously. You are better to be merciful than to be overjudgmental and critical. It is far better for you as a child of God to be merciful and loving and kind and showing forgiveness. You're far safer in doing that than you would ever be. Or most likely ever be, I should say, to cast the judgment. Again, I want to turn you over to the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 13 now. James chapter 2 and verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. We need to be merciful, right? Right? You judge another man, and you might have judged him righteously, but if you don't show mercy, even as God shows mercy, we're going to be judged for not showing mercy, and God will measure out that 
to us. That's the teaching of the verse. So listen very carefully. Mercy is more desirable in the child of God than a critical spirit. Because you can't go wrong with mercy, but you can go wrong in judgment. <laughs> Mercy is more desirable in the child of God than a critical spirit. Because you can't go wrong with mercy, but you can go wrong in your judgment. Alright? The context, of course, the Lord is teaching in front of all of these Pharisees and these Sadducees, all of these righteous people that thought they were more righteous than everybody else, thought they had the right to judge, thought that they had everything all together, that they go to the temple, they go to pray, they give their alms, they give their tithe, they give their prayers, they're doing everything right, and so they have all right and all ability to go and judge and get everybody fixed up. And the Lord is saying, hey! Well, hey, that's my word. But look... Right? How can you do this when you've got this beam in your own eye? That's the teaching that we're going to certainly be getting into next week. And I want to leave you with just a few verses from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. Whosoever thou art that judges. For whosoever and thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. For we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. God, Almighty God, is the righteous, true judge. Verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. But thou Preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Right? So. We must very careful, very careful, better to show mercy than to give wrong judgment. I'll leave you with that. I'll close before I damage the message any further. Shall we stand together to be dismissed?